Good morning, Flag Church. Good. Nice to see all of you here, nice and dry. I uh, remembered to bring uh, dry shoes, or new shoes, I should say, so I can swap, but not jeans. So I've got, like, wet jeans, but it's all good. But you guys are all nice and dry. The parking team did an amazing job, didn't they, with those umbrellas? Can we give it up for the parking team? Yes. They're awesome guys, awesome guys. So, hey, uh, we are excited, like we said, for Pastor Tom and Lori. We just ask that you continue to be praying for them as they transition and they got all of the moves coming. You know how that is to move from one state to another and all of the craziness that comes with that. But we're super excited. We'll be here October 6th. Uh, so we just ask that you be praying and uh, as they make that transition. So we are wrapping up our series today, <clears throat> talking about fear. And uh, we've done this the last three, two weeks, and this is our third week talking about it. Uh, but fear, we all have different kinds of fear, right? Uh, now, for some of you, maybe you're afraid of storms, okay? Maybe you've had some bad experiences. I don't know, I love storms. Like, if I'm getting ready to go to bed, I'm like, man, if there's a storm coming, it's the best thing, because you can sleep well. Lightning, thunder, all of the rain, and all of that, right? Now, my kids, on the other end, different story. So even though I love storms... I don't like storms because guess what happens? They get in our bedroom, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, we all have these different kinds of fears. And so, we looked <clears throat> week one, what is fear? Uh, a fear is an unpleasant, often strong emotion uh, caused by anticipation or awareness of danger, okay? So we know that there is some danger, and so we have these emotions and we have these feelings that start to creep up uh, that cause us to fear things, okay? And uh, most times, and most times, these are bad stuff that kind of get us. And then we look to the second definition of what fear is, which is a profound reverence and awe which is to be inspired, especially towards God. And so we've been talking about this kind of fear, the fear towards a God, a holy God, not a fear that cripples us, not a fear that causes this panic in us, that causes us to sweat and have anxiety and worry, but a fear that brings freedom, a fear that brings life and hope into our lives, a fear that is good for us, a fear that we find in the Bible many times that's talked about that is healthy for us, a reverent fear towards our God. And we see that, that we have this anchor verse in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, talking about the true, uh, sorry, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And many of you have been reading along with the reading plan in Proverbs, been encouraging just to see how many of you have been doing that and just seeing all of the comments. And we see if you've been reading that the book of Proverbs is full of wisdom that helps us know how to do life well. Teachings and, and uh, thoughts on how to live life, how to navigate life through this, uh, this, uh, through this uh, world that we are in. And uh, so when we read God's word, we see that we gain wisdom and then we also gain understanding. So week one, we talked about what does it mean to fear God? Fe uh, what does it mean? It is to have a humble heart, to be humble enough to say, you know what, God, uh, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I can't figure this thing out. I need you. I'm humble enough to seek the adv advice and the wisdom of God. And so we have this humble heart. Secondly, is to have a contrite spirit, which is basically stating that I am sinful. You admit that you are sinful, that you are broken, that you need help, that there is no way that you can do this on your own. You're a sinful being. And lastly, to tremble at my word, which means basically when we read God's word, which is full of truth, which is full of wisdom, we learn from it and we go, you know what, I, this, this is bad for my life, what I'm doing because of what God's word is saying, so I'm going to make some adjustments, I'm going to adjust and I'm going to tweak and I'm going to go in a different direction. That's called trembling. That is taking God's word and applying it to our lives and knowing, you know what, this is important for me. Versus going, man, that is so awesome. It's so good, but I'll go do what I want. How many times do we do that? We see God's word in the morning. We read it and we go, man, this is so awesome. This is so good. This is so relevant. But then, oh, but I'm just going to do what I do every day. Right? That's not trembling at God's word. That is basically saying, God's word's out there, but I have nothing to do with it. I'll just read it, but I don't, it's, not, it's not for me. We don't say it that way, but we act that way, right? 
So we look at how it's important. And what does it mean to fear God? It's to tremble at God's word. We talked about don't run from the fear of God. A lot of us run from the fear of God because this world has portrayed God as this evil monster that's out to get us, that is going out to make our lives miserable. Man, if you go to church, it must be really boring. You're boring Christians, right? Not true. And so we, we, we run from the fear of God because we've been, we have this understanding of who God is as this bad person. And you know what? When you do that, you end up running into the wrath of God because God says, hey, here is good and here is bad. You have a choice. If you choose good, great. You've come into my love. But if you choose bad and you do your thing, yes, there is a wrath. And you will eventually fear him. But instead of fearing God and running from him into his wrath, we talk about how we can fear God and run towards him in a holy, reverent fear. And then we experience freedom. We experience life. We experience hope. We experience his love. He embraces us with his love when we fear him and run towards God. Week two, we talk about why fear the Lord. Why do we need to fear God? See, when we fear God, you don't, ha- you don't receive condemnation. There's no judgment. There's not this, you're not good enough. There's not this sentencing that's going to come in your life one day when Jesus comes because Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. There's going to be this judgment day when he's going uh, uh, to judge his people and he's going to say, man, amazing job. You knew me. You had a relationship with me. You were awesome. Yeah, here is heaven. Who are you? I never knew you. You did your thing. You just went about doing your thing. You chose to ignore me. Well, guess what? There is a judgment. You're going to hell. There is that, you don't have that condemnation. We see that you receive the spirit that gives life and peace through Christ Jesus. When we are in Christ Jesus, we receive the spirit of life and we receive the spirit of peace. And we talked about this last week, how when we are grafted into the tree that is of life, the tree of God, then we receive the nutrients from that tree, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit coming into our lives transforms us and gives us life and hope. Versus we could be, transform, uh, we could be transplanted into the tree of life, uh, into this world, and the things of this world, and the nutrients coming out of that tree is not going to give us life and hope. It's going to be destructive. And so we see that. And then thirdly, we receive the spirit of sonship. God is calling you his sons and daughters when we are in Christ, when we fear God, the God of this universe, the God that created all things, the God that has power over all, all, uh, all of creation, all, everything that we see is calling you and me, his sons and daughters, and we earn that by becoming connected to him, by fearing him. So this morning, I want to talk about the how and how. The how and how. The how do I fear God and how does it impact me? How does it, how does it impact me? How does it change my life? So we're going to get through the fill in the blanks in the beginning so we can focus throughout the message. Here we go. We get all the fill in the blanks all at once today. So if you're you're a note taker, here we go. How do I uh, fear God? Firstly, to love him and obey his commands. Okay? We need to love him and obey his commands. Second, to say no to sin. Okay? How do I obey God or how do I fear God? Is to say no to sin. And thirdly, uh, to live according to his word, okay? That's how I fear God. But I want to break it down even further. How do I fear the Trinity? Because God is the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So how do I show holy fear towards God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, okay? So we see here with fearing uh, fearing, uh, God the Father, our Heavenly Father, when we love him, and we obey his commands, then we show a holy fear towards our heavenly father, God the Father. When we say no to sin, when we say, you know what, I'm a wretched sinner, and I'm going to change, I'm going to receive your sacrifice, I'm going to receive your gift that you gave me, and, and we say no to sin, we fear God the Son, Jesus Christ, because we're thankful for his gift. And thirdly, when we take the words that we see in God's word and we live according to his word, and we'll look at this here in a little bit, we show God the Holy Spirit a holy fear. 
Because the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches us God's word. And when we take it and we apply it and we live by it, now we start to show the Holy Spirit a holy fear. So I'm going to break this down one at a time. The first one, God the Father. How do I show God the Father a holy fear? We talked about what is fear. What is the fear of God? Being humble, having a contrite spirit, and having tremble, uh, being a tremble towards his word. So being humble. When we humble ourselves, see, we can't obey his commandments if we don't humble ourselves. It is hard to say, you know what, I'm going to obey what you say by having a prideful heart. How many prideful people are obeying what is out there? They do their own thing. It's a me mentality. Entitlement, right? What do we live in a world today? A world of entitlement. It's about me, what I want. How can it serve me? How can it make me better? Is that humble or is that pride? I mean, you apply this in your marriage. You apply this in your relationship with your kids. You apply this with your boss. You apply this anywhere. When you, it's about me, nothing seems to work well. But when it's about someone else, everything seems to fall into place. And so we see here, we say, God, it's not about me. It's about what we, I humble myself because I know what you uh, want for me. I know that you're good for me. I love you and I humble myself and I obey your commandments. When we do that, we show our heavenly father a holy fear. We, we show him the, the reverence that he deserves. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. And he says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always. Here we see they're talking about the Israelites. And God the Father is saying, Oh, my man, he's not being angry. When you read that, it doesn't sound like he's being angry or he's condemning. He's saying, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands. He's concerned about his children. He's concerned about the Israelites. And he's like, I wish they would listen. I wish they would obey. I wish they would keep my commands. And that's kind of what he says to us this, uh, this morning. He's saying the same thing to you and me. And why does he say that? So that it might go well with them and their children forever. It's goodness. It's not punishment. He's a kind father that is looking out for his children. We see in Psalms 118, verse 8 through 16. And here is the psalmist, and he's writing once again, God's heart for the Israelites here, the chosen people. And here's what he says, Hear me, my people, and I will warn you. God wants to warn you when there is danger coming your way. He sees it, he knows ahead, and he wants to tell you. But here's the thing, Hear me, my people, and I will warn you, if you would only listen to me, Israel. If you would only listen. How often do prideful people listen? Are you a listener? Do you listen to God's word? I mean, listen to God's voice? Or do you just talk to him and that's it? How often do you listen to what he has to tell you? How do you know what is coming around the corner if you don't listen to him? He goes on to say, You shall have no foreign gods among you. You shall not worship any god other than me. Unfortunately, we've we got to understand this. And that may sound kind of arrogant and uh, a bold statement. What God is saying is, you know what? I created you. I am your creator. I know how you work. I know what's best for you. I know how you function. I know what will make you uh, come alive. I am your creator. Unfortunately, we don't go to God and ask and seek wisdom and listen. We go to everything, everyone else in the world for wisdom, for insight, for direction. And those people become our gods, right? And God is saying, man, I don't need you to have any other gods. I just need you to listen to me. I need you to pay attention to what I'm saying. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Here is God bringing the people of Israelites out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery. He frees them. Israelites come out, they're excited, and guess what happens? 
And he goes on to say, and you open, uh, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Uh, but my people would not listen to me. So what did the Israelites do after they came out of bondage? They decided to take things into their own hands and do whatever they wanted, right? Just like how, what we do. We're in trouble. We're like, God, I need help. God, I need help. We're in trouble. God, I need help. Okay, God rescues you. Come out and you're like, oh, I got this. Where's God? Who needs God? I got this, right? We don't say that, but that, that's how we act. And we go about doing our own thing. Because we're prideful people. And we see the Israelites doing just that. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. Which sounds like pride. Pride that we tend to have. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. So basically God is saying, you keep doing this. I'm going to let you do what you want. You keep asking me and asking me and asking me. And I say, it might not be a good thing. I'm going to give it to you. And guess what? You're going to have a hardened heart. You're going to have a stubborn heart. And here is the dangerous place. When we have a stubborn heart, uh, that means you've asked. And sometimes you start to believe that what you've asked is really good. And it's from God. Because he gave it to you. But it really, it's not. It's what you wanted. And so you start to believe this lie that you're, what you have right now is from God. And you go down that path. Now when truth comes and tries to speak to you, you can't get anywhere because your heart is hardened. That's a dangerous place to be. If my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? Basically, God is saying, you know what? If you would just listen, I'll take care of all of the details. I've got you. I can handle your life. But we're too proud sometimes to submit to God. We're too proud to ask for help. We're too prideful to listen. We're too busy. We're too focused on our own wants and needs and not what God wants. And then he goes on to say, those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their punishment would last forever. That's pretty harsh. <laughs> there is a punishment. It's in God's word. There's this thing called judgment day when God is coming. And you know what? We have the freedom today to choose. We have the freedom to choose what we want. But there are consequences for our choices. And some of the choices that we make, the consequences will be met on that day of judgment when Jesus looks at you and said, I never knew you. You never followed me. You never chose me. You never received my gift. You did your thing. And so your punishment is eternal death which is hell. Oh, you chose well, my son, my daughter. You loved me. You received my gift. You followed me. You had a relationship with me. Hey, your reward is heaven. Eternal life with me. And then he goes on to say, but you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with the honey from the rock, I would and I would satisfy you if you would follow me, if you would be humble. If you would listen to me. See, pride. Pride is unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority. Just think about that. Do you have pride? All of us do. We all have pride. We're prideful people. Okay? At different levels. But we all have pride. How do we, ha how do we um, overcome pride? By being humble. Pride leads to our downfall. Pride leads to a, heart, a hard heart. A stubborn heart. That means we want what we want because we know what's best. We know what's right. Pride leads to you doing what you want to think, what you think is best for you. And, but here's the crazy thing. Pride leads to the lack of the fear of the Lord because you can't have pride and fear God because it's like two bosses. It doesn't work that way, right? You're the boss and God's the boss? How does that work? Uh-uh. You can't be the boss and God can't be the boss. So you got to submit and God becomes that boss. Humble, which is freedom from pride or arrogance. Humble has its origin from this Latin word called humilis, which means low. Low, which means God is above and I am lower than God. That means I'm submitting to God. I'm coming underneath his authority. I understand that he knows better than me. He's got my best interest. I'm lower than God. How do we do that in life? How do we do that in everyday life where we show God? Because you can't just say, God, yeah, yeah, right, but we don't show it. Some ways that we do that in service, 
and you're not just in service. You can do this anywhere. You can do this in your home. You can do this at, at, at wherever you spend time with God. Is when we get down on our knees. You may have seen some people get on their knees when they worship God, when they're in service, they're on their knees, and what they say is, God, you know what? I'm submitting. I'm submitting to your authority. Does this look prideful to you? Or does this look humbling? God, I know that you are above me, and I am lower than you, and I am submitting. Okay? Another way that we do this in worship is when we raise our hands. God... I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering to you because I know that you know what's best for me. And so I'm surrendering to your will. I'm surrendering to your plans. I'm surrendering it to your, li- your direction for my life, your will for my life. So we surrender by raising our hands. We communicate that. We, we say that through our words. God, you are the king of my life. I submit to your authority. I need your guidance. I need your direction. I I understand that you've got my best interest. So we communicate that. And then lastly, we spend time reading his word. Because if we are humble, then we will pick up God's word because we know that we need God's word. We know that it is the instruction manual for our life. We know that it tells us how to live life here on this earth. That's being humble. That's submitting to God. So, question this morning, do you have a heart that is humble, that is pliable? Do you have a heart that is in love with the Father? Do you have a heart that is dependent on the Heavenly Father? Because humility says, you know what, God, I need you. I need your word. I need what your word has for me. I need it to apply to my life. Whereas pride says, I got this. I don't need your word. We don't say it that way, but we live it that way. When we don't spend time in His Word, when we read His Word and don't apply it, you're basically saying, ah, yeah, that's all good, but I got this. And that's pride. So how does it impact me? How does being humble and, uh, and loving God and obeying His commandments, showing fear towards the Heavenly Father, uh, help me? It... it um, gives me the favor of the Heavenly Father. I need my Heavenly Father's favor. It protects me. My Heavenly Father protects me from harm. He provides for me. He takes care of my needs. And we find this in in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 2, and he says, so that, basically saying, fear God, so that your children and their children um, after they may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. This is not just a you thing. This is a generational thing. This impacts your children and their children and their children and they learn how to fear God by you learning how to fear God. And when you learn how to fear God, then God says, guess what? You will have long life. You will have a life that is blessed here on this earth, but also long life, meaning spending eternity with Him in heaven. Think of your past. Maybe you didn't come from a family that knew Jesus, and you were lucky that you crossed paths with somebody that talked to you about Jesus, and you are thankful. But what would that have looked like if you had a family that loved Jesus? How would that have changed some of your circumstances? How would that have changed some of the decisions that you made or the choices that you took? What's going to happen to your generation that's coming after you? What choices are they going to make? How is it going to be impacted? What role do you play? Psalms 112 verse 1 talks about, Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in His command. God says, you know what, I will bless you for fearing me, for obeying my commands, for falling in love with me. So are you fearing the Lord this morning? Second, say no to sin. Say no to sin. We talked about having a humble heart. What does it mean to fear God, to have a humble heart? Secondly, is to have a contrite spirit, okay? When you have a contrite spirit, that means you're saying, you know what, I am sinful, God. I am sinful, Jesus. I I have sin in my life, and I'm going to receive your gift, and I'm going to say no to sin. And when I say no to sin, and I start to live that lifestyle, I'm showing a holy fear to Jesus, to Jesus Christ. 
God the Son. Because God the Son came into this world to die for you and me, and He brought us a gift, His sacrifice of His life. We have a choice to choose or to reject. When we say no to sin, we are choosing to live a life that is pure, and we are thankful for Jesus' sacrifice. But when we say yes to sin, we're basically saying, Jesus, your sacrifice, oh, it's all good, but I'm just going to do my thing. What does that look like? Does that look like fearing the Son of God? Or does that look like disrespecting the Son of God? See, when we have a contrite spirit and we say no to sin, then we start to show holy fear towards the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it starts by us first recognizing that we are sinful. We're all sinful. We've all fallen short. And that we cannot save ourselves. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. There's no steps. You can't do step one and step two to save yourself. You can't do good works to save yourself. You can't say, well, guess what? I served at the Lord's diner. I gave all these poor people all this food. I took care of the needy. And so guess what? No, it doesn't work that way. There are so many good people today in this earth that are going to hell because they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They haven't accepted the gift of salvation. Goodness doesn't save us. God wants us to be good, but what saves us is the fact that we have received the sacrifice of Jesus. There's no quick fix out there to save yourself. You need a savior. You need Jesus. That's why he came into this world. God saw that we were broken, we were separated from him, and so he sent his son, Jesus, into this world to be the ultimate sacrifice. And so Jesus brought himself into this world as a human, and then he died for you and me, the ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. And when we receive that, and we stay away from sin, now we start to fear the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do I do that? I start by recognizing that He is my ultimate sacrifice. He is my Savior. I need Him. Today we're going to be ta- participating in communion to remember, to, re- to remember what Jesus did for us. Do you stop and think about that? Do you think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and me? Do you reflect on that? The pain that He went through, the agony, the torture, the bleeding the mocking for you and me so that our relationship can be restored back to the Father. Do we walk every day remembering that or do we just go about doing life? Do we show him the holy fear that he deserves? To love him, secondly, to love him and receive his gift. When we love him and say, thank you, Jesus, for your gift and we show him appreciation and love genuine love, then we fear him. We show a holy fear. And then we continue to seek him and build a relationship with him. See, it doesn't work where you give your life to Jesus Christ and say, you know what, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. It's all good now, I can do my thing. No, it doesn't work that way. You give your life to Jesus Christ, that's the beginning, that's the starting point of your new journey. Now you start to live with Jesus. You start to build a relationship with Him because He's the one that cleanses you. He's the one that purifies you. He's the one that sanctifies you. He's the one that removes the contaminants that's in your life. Because see, before Jesus... You were a very contaminated person. You had anger. You had hatred. You had addictions. You had bondage, right? You had things that you did that were not so cool. There were things coming out of your mouth that you weren't proud of. You were doing things that if people saw, you would run and hide. But then you give your life to Jesus Christ. It doesn't all go away. It's still there. You just gave your life to Jesus Christ. Now Jesus comes into your life through a relationship with him. And it, it's an ongoing process. And then he starts to take pieces out of your life. He says, yeah, that's not good for you. That was not meant to be in here. Oh, that's not good for you. That's not meant to be in here. Let me give you something else that's good for you. Now your vocabulary starts to change. Your anger disappears after time. You start to be freed from bondage. And there's a new life that starts to re- uh, come out of there. It's called sanctification. It's an ongoing process. So you've got to have a relationship. Proverbs 16, 6 talks about this. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. When we love him and we're faithful, sin is atoned for. But through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. Because evil constantly keeps coming at us. 
You walk out of these doors, evil is going to come find you. And the way you avoid evil is having a holy fear towards the Lord. And you recognize and you go, oh, that's not for me. I should walk away from that. That's temptation. I should walk away from that. So how does it impact me? It restores your relationship. When you have a holy fear towards Jesus Christ, it restores your relationship back to the Father. The Father doesn't look down and see a sinful person. He looks down and he sees the blood of Jesus covering you because you've received his blood and he sees a child of God. He says, that's my son. That's my daughter. A child, a restored relationship. He refines you. He cleans you from the inside out. He purifies you, takes all the contaminants out, and he starts to put good stuff in your life, the stuff that was meant to be there so that it lines up with his will for your life, his plan for your life. And you start to see it's kind of like taking a car to the garage and having the tires aligned. Before that, you start driving on the highway, and it's like all crazy, and your, your car is shaking, and it's doing all kinds of stuff. But once you have an alignment, guess what? It's smooth, right? That's kind of what happens with Jesus when he starts to refine you and purify you. He separates you from sin because you're attracted to sin. As human beings, we get attracted to sin, human nature, right? He says that's not good for you. He separates you. And lastly, he sanctifies you, which is an ongoing process. So question, do you have a holy fear towards Jesus this morning? What kind of fear do you have towards Jesus? What have you done with his sacrifice? What have you done with what Jesus did on Calvary's cross? Are you thankful? Have you accepted it? Or have you just thrown it away? If you've, re if you've received Jesus Christ into your life, is your life less evil today? from when it started? Is it less wicked, deceitful? Does it have less sinful words, sinful actions? Or do you still look the same? Because if you still look the same, it's kind of a question you've got to ask yourself, did I really receive Jesus Christ? Because isn't he supposed to change me? A holy fear helps us do that. Lastly, to live according to his word. Okay, we talked about humble, contrite spirit. This is what fear of God is. And lastly, to fear the Lord, right? To fear his word, to have a whole a trembling towards the word. And so we see here that when we have a trembling towards his word, we live according to his word. And when we do that, we show the Holy Spirit a holy fear. Now, this is a little backwards, and I'm going to explain this. You cannot tremble at his word if you don't understand his word, right? How many of you have been there? You've read the Bible and you're like, dude, this is like Greek. I don't get it. Where do I start? Where do I end? It's such a big thing and it's like, uh, I don't get it, right? How many of you have been there? Let's be honest. I've been there. Okay, yeah, exactly. We've all been there. And that's normal. It's not, like, and we fear, we go, oh man, I can't understand God's word is not for me, right? No, not true. The reason we cannot understand God's word, because the understanding of God's word comes through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps you understand God's word. And so when you receive Jesus Christ into your life, your body becomes a temple for the Holy Spirit to come and live in it. Okay? The Holy Spirit come, comes and resides in you. Now, just because the Holy Spirit resides in you, if you don't acknowledge that the Holy Spirit resides in you, He can't help you, right? So you acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is in you, and you talk to the Holy Spirit and have a conversation. Hey, Holy Spirit, can you help me with this, please? Because I'm not getting this. This is like Greek. Okay? And then the Holy Spirit goes, oh, I got this. I'll help you. And so he activates the word of God, and he's like this jump start, that he jump starts the word of God in you, and he starts to bring new revelation. And you start to read the word of God with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, because you've asked him, now you go, whoa, this is speaking to me now. This makes more sense, right? And, and it becomes a revelation, and now you're, the light bulbs go off, and you're like, wow. And see, it begins... When we have a holy fear towards the Holy Spirit and understand the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity. He is a person and not a thing. He's an actual being that is out there sent by Jesus to be a helper. And we find that 
in John chapter 16, verse 7. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Jesus said this. It's for your very own good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, you know what, I'm going, so I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's going to be a helper. He's going to be your teacher. He's going to be your counselor. He's going to be your guide. He's going to help you navigate through this life. And he's going to use my word, which is God's book, his guidebook for your life, to help you live a life that is pleasing to God the Father. We see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active. Focus on those two words. The word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates e uh, even to divide soul and spirit, joint and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. How does the word of God be live and active? It was written like 2,000 plus years ago. How is it relevant in today's world? How is it relevant in today's society with the vocabulary that we use and the lifestyle and the culture? How in the world can the word of God be relevant? The only way that it can be relevant is when the Holy Spirit jump starts it and makes it relevant for you. And the word of God is relevant for you because you can read it. Some of you are reading through the Proverbs and you're going, whoa, th that's me. I need to work on that. How is that? Because it is alive and active because the Holy Spirit does that. He brings it alive. But he can't jumpstart the word of God and make it active and alive for you and relevant for you if you do not have a vibrant relationship with the Holy Spirit, which means you are in conversation with the Holy Spirit. You are in a relationship daily with the Holy Spirit. So when you wake up and you are praying to God and you're praying to Jesus and you're praying to the Holy Spirit as a person, Holy Spirit, I need you to help me through life today. I need you to be my navigator. I need you to be my source of wisdom. I need you to guide me. I need you to teach me. Do you seek counsel of the Holy Spirit? Are you listening to the instruction of the Holy Spirit? Do you have a holy fear towards the Holy Spirit? We started this whole series looking at this scripture in Proverbs 9.10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord, which is the Trinity. When I, fear the God, when I fear God the Father, when I fear God the Son, when I fear God the Holy Spirit, that is the beginning of wisdom because there is a revelation that comes to us. And when we understand the, the blood of Jesus that was poured out for you, now there's a new understanding that comes and your life starts to be transformed. It doesn't happen without the fear of the Lord so how do I fear him again to love him and obey his commands to say no to sin to separate us from sin not to continue to keep living a life of sin doesn't work that way and to live according to his word which means spending time in his word and letting the Holy Spirit bring new revelation and, and re a revelation that is relevant to your life I've heard people talk about this many times. Man, I read that scripture, scripture and I've read it 20 times. And man, this time I read it and it's totally different. And, it, and it, it relates to me differently. I'm like, well, that's the Holy Spirit because he knows what you're going through in life right now. And he's able to use that scripture to help you in the situation that you're in right now. So where does your life, what does your life look like? Do you have a holy fear? Do you have a relationship? Are you in love? with God the Father? Are you in love with Jesus? Are you seeking the counsel of the Holy Spirit? Because God wants that for you. God wants that for you. 